Blah. Hey, what's going on? Do you miss me? Because I miss you guys. I have been so incredibly busy and it's just been non-stop work, 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 work as I try to get my second feature length film ready for its world premiere at the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia at the Genre Blast Film Festival. If you are local in New York at some point, we will be doing a localized screening and eventually it will make its way out onto distribution platforms. However, you Patreons, you will be able to see the movie as soon as I have a screener. I will upload it directly to the Patreon via unlisted YouTube link and you can watch it for fun and for free because that's part of being a Patreon, right? You know, uh, I'm so grateful for your support. So when I have something that I can show you instantaneously, I am going to show it to you instantaneously. And that will be something. So you guys will get to see it before anybody else gets to see it outside of the Genre Blast Film Festival. In the meantime, as I get this Marky Ramon Lodi Files episode ready for the month of August, I also wanted to take a moment and apologize that it's been so long since I recorded that eerie interview. It's five and a half hours or six hours. I don't even know, remember what the time, time I was, I was telling some people that it was like close to seven hours. Then I actually like added up all the pieces and it was like way less and I felt really embarrassed about it. I think it's like, it's like five hours and 40 minutes, five hours, 38 minutes, something like that. And it's just a lot to go through. It's very daunting. When I pre-record stuff, I like to take out all the ums, the uh, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, when I can, because it just makes for a better listening experience. And when I'm not talking, I think when I'm, when I go, um, or, you know, that's me trying to think and like collect my thoughts when I've like rewatched streams, trying to sort of like football player style, like break down, like, okay, how is my presentation? Am I, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? How can I change myself and be better in the future? So all of the ums and eh and the uh, 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 have been painstakingly removed from this interview. And there is more coming. Notice how I'm trying to speak without any of the ums right now. It's really hard. I have to think about it before I speak. So there are more parts coming. They'll be coming in the future. And I will just, I'll pop them out to you like candy, like candy. And I just want to say thank you again, everybody, for being a part of the Patreon. I, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. I really am. I want to keep it going. I want to keep it growing. You know, I want to keep growing. And that is not easy to do. I'm very... I don't really like, you know, I mean, I push the Patreon and stuff, but I'm not. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know. But I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like 
a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. I've seen other people push, and they, they're really pushy, and it makes me uncomfortable. So I, I try not to, I try to have something to offer, you know? Uh, I think that's important. In any case, I hope you enjoy Eerie Vaughn Part 1. I will say this, I was super nervous to do this because Eerie is just one of those, he's like a great white whale, someone I've been trying to interview for a long time, and it's just never materialized for numerous reasons and now it finally did and I, I once I had him I didn't let him go I spoke to him for a long time and you will hear us just go through the entire gambit I mean we ran through everything all of the misfit stuff will probably not end up on YouTube so enjoy it as a Patreon because nobody on YouTube is going to see it maybe the YouTube members will but not not any it won't be in the regular broadcast stream on YouTube. All right. Oh, no, you can't, because I was muted. Ha uh ha. -huh. Oh, oh, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Okay. I'll just hit leave meeting. No! Hey, hey good talking to you. See no! you. Uh, no! Change my phone number. Oh, God. Quickly, Why? quickly change my phone number. Why has this happened to me? No. Yeah. Yeah, you, no. um, you... <laughs> Yeah, you try to call me, I'll, I'll have you killed. No. And I'm, After getting, this. And I'm getting threatened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if I tell all you people every time I'm like, look, I'll give you my number, but if you call me and try to come over here, you're in trouble. It's like, I've had it up to here with you misfits nerds and your stupid fucking questions endlessly. No, no. <laughs> No, I'm fine with that. I just don't want to see anybody. No, I don't mind that. That's the easy part. Right. <laughs> I, I Listen, I hope you're ready. I'm about to put you through your paces. I'm going to do like an intro and, and we'll bring you in. I'm just going to start right now. Ready? And. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to a very special episode of the Streaming Evil Live show. People have been asking for this for some time. I mean, I'm always getting messages. You got to have Eerie on. You got to have Eerie. Did you talk to Eerie yet? Get Eerie on the show. And I am honored, beyond honored, that Mr. Vaughn has graced us with his presence. He's decided to make an appearance on the show. So I'd very much like to welcome Mr. Erie Vaughn to the Streaming Evil Live show. Welcome, Erie, to the show. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> um, what was that, the Screaming, the Screaming Eagle show? Yeah. What am I on now? Yeah, what is this? Yeah. Screaming Eagle? Yes, the yeah. it's where he, you are on the yes. Screaming Eagle show where eagles dare. And uh, we That's ain't no right. son of a bitch, exactly. okay? So yeah, that, yeah. there's that. Well, as soon as soon as everybody, as soon as everybody asks me to do stuff too many times, that's when I don't do it. So, you know, you should just learn from that. Well, I, you know, I've heard that. Listen, I, just to clarify, Erie, I have, I've met Glenn Danzig twice, but I don't know Glenn Danzig out of a hole in the wall, right? I don't, I don't know him, but from what people have told me about Glenn Danzig. He's the type of guy where you say, hey, Glenn, what about red? And Glenn goes, no, blue. Like the exact opposite of whatever. Sounds like a lot of, sounds like a lot of women I know. There you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> speaking of women that you know, I'd actually like to take a moment and pay a little bit of tribute to someone who passed away today. Very sad. Elizabeth Boris has left us. She She passed away. She was a big, big fan of all things Danzig, Sam Hain, and Misfits. 
and she fought a very valiant battle with cancer, and I'm very sad to hear about her passing. So just wanted to uh, shout her out and dedicate this episode to her in her memory and whatnot. So, yeah, she was she her and her uh, friends, you know, used to go on the road and stuff, and they they do like a week or two weeks of shows, and that would be their vacation, just like you know the Grateful Dead people, you know. And so they did that for years up until I quit the band, you know, so um, I still kept in touch with her. Uh, not as much. Um, she started running after Marilyn Manson for a while. And so I was just like, oh, really? That's nice. Um, so now I, yeah, I heard about it too. And I was just like, oh, that really sucks. You know? It does. It's like, yeah, what are you going to do? So. Yeah, I was glad I got to know her and her friends, too. They were all great people, so it's a big loss for sure. She was, a, she was a wonderful woman, sweet woman, and just wanted, I feel like it would be remiss to not at least mention her in passing before we begin. Eerie, I want to know, are you excited for the new Elvis movie? Um, you know, it's pretty tough having uh, read like 50 Elvis books um pretty much have a really good memory for trivia uh read anything that pops into my head and i remember it it's not gonna be you know for me to walk away and go "Hmm, didn't know that that's probably not gonna happen you know i just want to see what um what the takes are everybody's because every time it's a different story they keep saying oh you're gonna find out all this stuff no you're not you know it's like it's just somebody's view just like when Oliver Stone did the Doors movie, it was like his fantasy of the Doors. Well, this could be this guy's fantasy of Colonel Tom. He seems to be obsessed with him um, or Elvis or whatever. And they're like, it, it's we're, we're going to talk about like the sexual stuff, like the reason the girls went crazy and stuff. And I was like, no, yeah, right. You're going to get that right, I bet. I mean, oh, it's just it's probably going to be terrible, but um, I'll watch it anyway. Um, I liked the when I saw the the hairspray uh, movie of uh, the first one before the the musical John Waters Divine. original, yeah, yeah, and um, the kid who who was the the good looking kid in that I said, who how come this kid's not playing Elvis? And when that came out, I said somebody's got to get this kid for Elvis. And then all of a sudden they had an Elvis TV show and he was the lead. And I'm like, good choice. He looks just like him, you know. And uh, yeah, I don't mind it. You don't have to look like him. I always hated the, the way they everybody tries to imitate him. You know what they should do? Go down to Memphis, hang out with some people. They all talk like that, okay? You know, just you got to get start from there. And then maybe you could throw in a couple of things, you know, little Elvis things, you know. But when they try to talk like Elvis or do all this, he never talked like that. You know, same with the singing. They all try to sing like that. It's just right. like... Oh yeah. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a big thing for me. We could talk for hours about that, but I, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'll see it when I get around to it. You know, I I think it's gonna be a a st- I think the best way to to phrase it, it's gonna be a stylized portrait of Elvis. That seems yes, you're right. There seems to be a, a special emphasis on the Colonel and his fixation relationship with Elvis. And I don't know, it, it looks very interesting. I'm a big fan of that. I like that filmmaker, Baz, whatever, the Australian guy. He did the Romeo and Juliet what movie. What else has he done? He did the Romeo and Juliet movie. He did Moulin Rouge. He did uh, Australia. He does these big, lavish, theatrical, cinematic productions. So whatever he's going to do with Elvis, even if it's not, I, I, you know, it probably won't be anything you don't know already, but it's going to be... For just like it's going to be a visual feast it's going to probably from what i've seen from the trailer it looks like it's going to be interesting on on some level and i am a very i don't know anything about elvis as a matter of fact this is going to shock you weary my introduction to elvis I, I don't even know if i want to admit this to you you're just going to make fun of me all right you ready for i'm a beatles guy i've always been a beatles guy my introduction uh-huh. to elvis was actually through danzig sings elvis <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Right, how do I leave call? Where's, this, uh, where's that button? Let me tell you something. Did you? What did you? Oh, what? it's not coming come up. Come on, come on. 
Come on. I know you listen. Oh, man. I know you listen to Danzig Where's sings Elvis. Beef? I know. Oh. No, I know you listen to it. Did you? Oh, I did once. Yeah, I had people were gonna ask me, so I right. listened to. Did you hate it? I, I got a. I, I got a. Got a burned copy. I initially thought it was okay, um, and then I listened to it again, and I was just like, oh, you know. But um, it, no, I understand what he wanted to do. Um, I just wish he had somebody, somebody else play on it and stuff, and. You know, whatever. It's it's fine. I'm glad he got to do it. Uh, it was my idea. You know, it's like I wanted him to do it all the way back then. Right. You know. Right. And of course, uh, when you wanted him to do it, he was like, "I'm not going to do it." And then he waited 30 years or whatever, and now here it is. No, he was he was always going to do it. I mean, it probably wasn't my idea, but I was the one who kept bringing it up. Right. Uh, right. He probably was had it in his timeline in his head saying. I'll do it, but I'm not ready to do it yet, which is perfectly fine. That's probably what it was. But, you know, you got to be able to, to do, you know, but he didn't, he didn't, um, he just did the ones he wanted. And he, he, it was fine, you know. I mean, if I was there, I wouldn't, I would have like bugged the shit out of him to, to, to do this and do that. And, <laughs> come on, it's got to sound like this. And I would call people and, you know, I would have totally got like the best players I could possibly get. He's got money, he could have got anybody. Um, and I would have said, all right, here's the songs I want to do, learn all these songs and I'm coming down and I'm just going to sing them. And that would be awesome. You know, because he just get a, re I'd call, I like when he did that Halloween show at the Roosevelt, I thought that was really cool. I'm like, oh, awesome. Like a, like a supper club thing, like Elvis used to do, you know? And, um, I said, if it was me and I had Glenn's money, I would call Paul Schaefer and say dude because he handles Damn. all that that stuff i would have said dude i'm gonna do an elvis show um i need you to learn these songs get me i need a band i need horns i need this i need that um send me the bill but we're gonna you know rehearsals are on saturday and that and that would have been totally cool and i was hoping he was gonna do something like that you know heard it was very good though yes i heard wonderful things from people who were there and i have to tell you i thought pocket full of rainbows was <laughs> no 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 listen to me listen pocket full of rainbows i think is the best danzig track since one of the best danzig tracks that he's done in 25 something years since the original band it's one of the ballsiest tracks he's done and it was you know danzig doing a song called pocket full of rainbows i mean come on yeah, I, yeah it's crazy i yeah um yeah, I know Glenn's sense of humor and stuff, so I could kind of get, you know, I mean, I don't know him anymore, really. It's been a long time, but he probably hasn't changed that much. Oh, you're steep. Yeah, I, I'm dancing I, plenty. I could have, I could have, um, I could have maybe seen him doing that as the joke back in the Misfit days or something, you know, just or do it at a show because he was a really goofball back then, you know. And that yeah, the Misfits been, did. Yeah. Uh, the Misfits did uh, "Heartbreak Hotel" or um, what Elvis song did they do? The um, the original Misfits. I mean, the Misfits. Yeah, they, they did. They did "Blue Christmas" once. I know they did "Blue Christmas." There was one other. And they one. did. They yeah. They did one other song. The, the only time, and I was there because I I I'm the one that, that Doyle asked me on like they had a show on. I don't know Friday Saturday night. Like the week before, Doyle said, Glenn needs to borrow some Elvis records. I said, what does he want? So I gave him a, he didn't, he, I don't think he told me, I, I gave him the Loving You soundtrack, which is my one of my favorite, probably my favorite film, and the 68 comeback, right? Because I didn't know what kind of Elvis fan he was I, um, at the time. So he picked a song on the Loving You so soundtrack called um, Got a Lot of Living to Do. It's a great track. That's what it was. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. You just, I, I was trying to remember what the track was. I thought it was Heartbreak Hotel. Got a whole lot of love yeah. to, living to do, living to do. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So, so they rehearsed it and stuff a couple of times and uh, they did it only that one time as far as I know, but amazing. it was, it was great. Yeah. And he, he had this little piece of paper and he had the lyrics on it and he, he had the lyrics wrong. And I said, that's not the line. He goes, yeah, it is. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm like, come on. You know, if you heard it, you heard the record last week. I've been listening to this for 10 years already. You know, like it's not the line. So, but it was great to see him, see them do that. It was, I always wanted him to do more of that kind of stuff. You know what? Bottom line, if Danzig sings Elvis is the final Danzig album, if he doesn't do another one, I think this is what I've been saying 
since the record came out. I think it's the perfect punctuation on the end of uh, like his recording career. I think it swings through the fences. Yes, I'm sure if you're an, a diehard Elvis fan like you or anybody else, you know, there's a thousand things that you might want to change or whatever. But for someone who is not even a casual Elvis listener, and not because I don't disrespect Elvis, I just just never was never on my radar. Just like I said, always a Beatles guy. Um, it was very interesting to take in Elvis this way, to hear Fever and Always On My Mind and all these songs. And then I discovered the, the Elvis original tracks and was just blown away. Somebody made a Spotify playlist with all the Elvis songs. So I got to hear the originals. And it was just, um, it was an education. It was very interesting. Elvis songs. Elvis right. was he doing covered, a lot of covers. He didn't, he didn't write any of his stuff. As a yeah, matter he, of fact... He did like almost his entire career was covers. Question, Yuri. Isn't it true that Elvis would go to guys and he would say, hey, I like your song. I'll tell you what. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover your song. You're going to give me 50% of the publishing. And he would get 50% of the publishing, but the guy, but he would cover the song, which would make the song really famous. And the guy would be making far more money than what he would have had if he had 100% of the publishing. Yeah, that's not true. Um, oh, that's what not happened true. Was, that's what not happened true. was he, he didn't care any. No, you got it wrong. He oh. didn't care anything about the money. It, the, it was the colonel that said, no, we want all the publishing. They didn't want 50%. They wanted all the publishing. So that's why Elvis, towards the end of his career, didn't get any of the good songs because there's plenty of good songwriters out there. He didn't get the, the top cream of the crop because they wanted to own the songs. That means they the the writers would have to settle for like either a cash up front or, gotcha. uh, you know, they might get, uh, be, you know, royalties for being on the record or or something for writing the song. But for publishing, Elvis would get all the publishing and that's wow. where all the money is anyway. Wow. So yeah, that's why he, he wanted to see the one thing was he, he recorded that uh, guitar man for, from Jerry Reed and Jerry Reed was in the studio. They also did U S mail that day and mm. they, they did a track Elvis. All I was cared about was the music and it came out great. And he really wanted to put it out like a single or right now, you know, and, and uh, so they get him up against the wall and, Jer tell Jerry Reed, well, we can't put out that song on Elvis if you don't give us the publishing. And he said, I don't give nobody my publishing. And that's, <laughs> and that's, I don't know how it ever, how they ever got a thing, but I know they, they didn't get his publishing. But yeah, that's one of the things as an Elvis fan. It's like, yeah, it's great. But towards the end, all he was doing was great, great kind of tired country covers from 50 songs going way back. Like, and they were great, and I love them. But I would have liked to see them sing, you know, keep going forward, you know. And uh, so that was that's that was the problem. Uh, you know. Thank you for clarifying that. It, I always thought it was fifth a fifty fifty split, and I always thought that was a pretty interesting fair shot. No, what for, you uh, said was great. Yeah, what you said would be a terrific deal. Yeah. So listen, I'll record your song, and you'll make a shitload right. of money. But I want right. half of this pub. It's almost right. like he would have been half the songwriter. Everybody, so, everybody yeah. works out. Everybody wins, you know? Yeah, that would have been fine, but that wasn't the case. Because if that was the case, you would have had, you know, Dolly had a song for Elvis, you know? Wow. So, wow. And that was the same, that was the same exact, you ask her, she, she'll tell you, yeah, he wanted all my publishing and Damn. I wouldn't give it to him. Damn.
Damn. Oh, oh, I know what it was. He wanted, <laughs> she wanted him to sing, I will always love you. That's what it was. And, and he she, wanted to, he, had written he wanted to do it. Yeah. He mm. wanted to do it. And they said, we want your publishing. And she said, no. And she kept it. And it was, she was right to do it. Cause when Whitney Houston did it, she made a ton of money off of that. Oh yeah. That was, that was like the song of 1991 or whatever. It was like a huge, it's huge still, so song. it's, it, he's, it's still paying the rent for her. I bet. Oh, oh man, definitely. Uh, what you call it? Uh, <laughs> subsidizing Dollywood. Let me ask you uh, before we launch into all the old nerdy shit. I just want to. I just want to ask you. You do. You have a new book coming out, and you also did a story I book. Hope so. Can you tell me a little bit about these projects? No, I got a. I got a children's book that I've been working on for a while. It's about a little witch, um, but I just the the big problem is. I've never written anything like song wise or anything for anybody else, like to, for anybody else to like, I don't care. You know, it's like, you, you don't like it. Great. But see this time I, I want to get a point across. And the only way you could do that is if you children's books have to have um, a, lesson. a lesson or a moral. Yeah. Right. And that's just traditional. And I think that's great because those things will stick with you forever. If you get read that book every day when you're three years old, you know, I've done it, you know, so I, I've always, I, the moral is always stuck with, I had this one basic idea, but I, I just, I could, I'd already done like a series of paintings of this character, you know? So I was kind of going along trying to make a storyline with these paintings and I just couldn't nail it down. So I'll, I think I've finally got what i want to say i just it's just it's like a a difficult song usually a good song comes right out of your head a difficult song you got to really work on and i'm worried it's going to be crappy so but yeah and the other book is the uh photography book you know the follow-up to my last one that um yeah should have been done a while ago but you know circumstances beyond your control you know of course, uh, of but, course. But it's going to be, it's like this stuff. I was just doing uh, uh, editing photos and looking at stuff today. Um, some more stuff. Uh, it's so good. Uh, the, I can't the pictures wait. look amazing. We can't <laughs> wait. Eerie, we can't wait. We can't wait. Yeah. Eerie. We can't yeah, wait. Well, you know. Plus, I got a record I'm working on, and I'm, um, I got to go finish mixing because same thing, COVID was a big problem. I was living in Nashville and um, got out of there and now I have to go back whenever I want to work on it. And um, it's been, you know, through the crappy weather and all the different COVID people, people have come and gone, like the original engineer dropped out of the project. And I'm like, now we can't find anything on the computer. <laughs> it's like, I was like, well, he didn't name all the files right. Or you oh. put this, I, you could find anything. I was like, oh man, it was almost like starting all over again. What, so, what kind of music is it, Erie? It's it's more like kind of country, you know. But okay. I could, it's it's in that vein. It's just that um, each song is different from the, the rest. Not in, like like there's not a metal song, and then there's you know not yeah, there's none of that crap. It's it's got a theme. It's a whole. It's an album. It's not like you know a single or whatever it's still an album concept and i still record the same way as we did you know um so it's but each song is different and i got a lot of different people playing on it because i had a chance to somebody was in town and said hey uh you know uh, can you come down here and lay down an organ track or can you bring your fiddle and uh play on a couple songs and we'll see if we want it use it you know and so it's really cool i got tired of making records by myself you know so but I could, I would have had it done by now if I was just doing it by myself. Isn't that the you way? Know. Is isn't that the way it always is? We talked about this previously. You got to work at the speed of people, and it's yeah. uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to uh, to make yeah. that happen. Are you? Tell me. I, I don't know why it just popped into my head, but I'm curious to know right now in the moment. Are you a fan of the Nick Cave album Murder Ballads? Um, I haven't. Yeah, I heard some of it, but. Um, it's been a long time. I feel um, like you'd really appreciate that record. Yeah, I do. But, you know, and I have friends that do that kind of stuff. Um, I um, I have to be in the mood. And my mood right now is uh, 
completely opposite of any of that kind of stuff. Ah. Um, it's just, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I don't know. I'm working on like singing better. Um, my harmonies working on harmonies all the time, like every day, just like going back to stuff. That's really sort of mindless and, and not mindless, but, but uh, poppy two minute, really good catchy songs that kind of stuff and i need to keep that to keep from going insane too so yeah i can't i can't go into any of the real dark and spooky shit at this mo at this point in time. i get i get eerie i get it i get it all right we are ready now to jump into our time machine and we are going to go back in time we're going to do the wayne's world doodaloo, 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 doodaloo. okay we're now back in time um lodi high school Tell me what it was like to be a punk rocker at Lodi High School, or let alone discovering punk rock in a place like Lodi, New Jersey. What is Lodi like? Like, tell me about Lodi in the 70s. Oh, well, it's like it's probably like everywhere else. Um, but we were close to Manhattan, so we got a lot of New York influence. You know, we were only like 10 minutes away. So if there was a band playing, we, we could easily go. Um, and there was a lot of music. Everybody was in a band. Like everybody I knew, everybody on my block, somebody played something or was in a band, which when I look at it now, it was so great that I, I kind of took it for granted. Um, it, it, was, it was most, I think a lot of the tough stuff was a little bit before my time like you'd always hear about somebody's brother getting killed somebody's brother like getting drunk and falling off the bridge and hitting his head and drowning um there was supposed to be a lot of crime um there's there's uh there's a little bit of uh you know um a mafia vibe there you know um we're right everywhere in that you know, one town over, or everything's connected in that certain area. So um, it, it was definitely interesting. Um, but other than that, like in your little neighborhood, my part, I was on the better side of town, like all the bad people, like the misfits and all those, they were all across the highway on the other side. Um, that's where all these shit usually hit the fan. You know, I was, I was in the more sheltered, better side. And we just played sports all day. We we made up games. We rode our bikes. We did all that stuff. That everybody's talking about like the last generation to do that. Yeah, I was one of those people, you know. And we, you know, we uh, came home when the lights came on, the street lights. You know, uh, we chased after the ice cream man. We did all. So it was pretty much the same as you know any other nostalgic trip from around the country. But the big thing I remember is the music. There was always somebody playing. A lot of places to play in Jersey. Um, and then you could just jump right over to New York, you know. So it was it was a cool place. And it was a lot of music in my, in my household. Um, all kinds of stuff. Big, you know, big uh, variation. Uh, a lot of different music, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was pretty normal really but high school was just you know, eighth grade was a little weirder than high school but um you could i wasn't re i wasn't outwardly a punk guy until like junior senior year because i would just get beat up you know you couldn't you couldn't you know have a mohawk or shave your head or wear funny clothes you just get beat up you know so if you liked um, you listened to some stuff you didn't make a point of it unless uh you're with people who weren't going to beat you up you know um, once you got older and you could handle yourself or maybe the big football players had all graduated, um, then you could start being a punk. And I started dressing like Clash or wearing skinny ties or doing stuff to my hair. And Doyle was dying his hair, different color every month, you know. So, but you had to, you had to be careful because otherwise they'd be like, you know, they call you and uh, they, they kick your ass, you know, stuff like that. You know, um, make, make fun of you all day, you know. It was it was tough. So now what is very interesting, you said till junior or senior year, that's when you started to outwardly show your punkness. But Doyle, as far back as eighth grade, was wearing 
you know, he had the pink hair and that yeah. whole graduation debacle. He was so he was at the forefront of maybe the class of 82 in that kind of way a little bit. Well, well, he he started off like that. He was wearing Jerry's old hand-me-downs, all his clothes, which is funny because they didn't fit him at all and they were like super tight and all the pants were really short. And they were all crazy. And you see any, any of those really old pictures where Jerry's dressed in like the New York Dolls or whatever? Um, yeah, Doyle was wearing all his clothes and just running around like a nut job in uh, mostly freshman year was the biggest, his biggest coming out party, I think. Um, really going for it. Um, but once he got in the Misfits, see, all that went out the window. Because you p- picture Captain Sensible in the Misfits, okay? That's what he was like in high school. He was like that, like crazy gold hair, like weird clothes. I mean, swastik is just anything he could do to attract attention. And then when he joined the Misfits, no. Then it was just like black hair, black clothes, you know, not black clothes, but like more he became he became cooler and you know, he was very outgoing and he became more like he is now, uh, more reserved, you know, so he could get away with it because all the everybody just thought he was just nuts. So nobody messed with him. And plus, his, he, he was a guy off of his his brother was still in school. His his other brother just graduated. They were both on the, all on a football team. So he had that sort of football players weren't going to beat him up, you know. But uh, yeah, there were, and there was nobody else. There was there was well, there was two other guys. The guys that played a lot of records for me. One guy was in um, Steve's band, um, and another guy was in Rosemary's Babies. Eventually, Chris Morantz uh, was that. Y- yeah, yeah, um, and uh, and Bob Montina. Um, those guys were playing me records and stuff, and they made subtle things like they were subtle. Their hair was a little spiky, and they would subtly wear like suit jackets and things and chris would wear weird weird big clunky shoes and he would dye his hair which if you were a guy you dyed your hair you were instantly a f- that's what they would call you um uh so there was almost no punks that were actually in school you just didn't have the nerve you know if there was like 10 or 12 of you sure but if there was one or two you know you'd get your ass kicked <laughs> you know and then here's the other thing, just to compound on that, since you stopped, brought this up already. So now, but at the same time, Doyle's also, Jerry's pulling Doyle into the city when he's going into the city with like, to like party and like be in, in the punk scene in that kind of way. Correct? On some level? I don't know. You know, to tell you the truth, he never told me none about that stuff. Like mm-hmm. my sister was taking me to shows, but I never saw him in there. Um, Your sister was into punk rock? Yeah, she's the one who got me into it, really. Oh. Um, yeah, see, I, I got into, like, Doyle told me about it, but then my sister was bringing home records. So, you know, I had real things to listen to, and she would show me pictures of the guys and the bands and stuff. And um, so, yeah, she and I were going um, going into the city, just going down 8th Street, and going to record st- uh, stores in um, St. Mark's and stuff, and going to Bleaker Bob's. And just going for, like on a Saturday for fun. Um, I wasn't going to any shows yet, but um, yeah, he never came back into school like the next day and said, "Oh, I went and saw this band or I did this." And he didn't tell. I mean, at the time, we would have been fourteen, fifteen, and you could have done it, but it just wasn't really done. Like you couldn't, if you were in Jersey, you couldn't go to a club in Jersey if you were fourteen. Right, you could do it right. in the city, but it wasn't like it was something you thought of. You know what I mean? Right. The you way know? I've when I've heard him talk about it, or maybe it was Jerry or a combination of the two, it always just seemed like 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 Jerry's like grabbing his kid brother and just taking him along wherever he's going, whether it's just like being I mean, at the same time, you have like Harley Flanagan is doing something similar to that. You got the guys in the Yeah, but Harley's a special case, you know. Harley was like 14 12 and he was kind of like 12 uh, 10. A war, he was he was like a ward of the the, the scene like he, right everybody looked took care of him and stuff mm-hmm. um but see you forget that like the punk rock thing was like new to, to glenn and jerry so the two of them 
were going out to the city. That's what I always heard. That those two right. were always going out to clubs and stuff. And if you think about it, you're like 18, 19, 20. Glenn was probably 22. Something. You're going to tag, bring a 14 year old kid when you're out, maybe trying to bang a chick or something. It's crazy. It's crazy. So it's crazy. It doesn't make, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm it not saying make it a didn't lot. happen, but it, you're, you're you right. Know. It doesn't make a lot in that kind of way, in that context that you're right. providing, it does not make a lot of sense. I agree. But interesting nonetheless. Now here's a now here's something I have never heard you talk about in interviews. I'm kind of curious to know. I yes, we know the story. You were introduced to the misfits through Doyle because you guys are in the same class, right? Blah, 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 blah. But even before you went and 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 shot the band in those ca- in the at the cave, what's known the infamous cave, the legendary cave. Um, right. What was what was was the name Glenn Danzig like was that a name that you had heard around school or something? I know he was out of school by that time. The Misfits had been had started up by two uh for like two years, right? By the time you had heard of them or something like that. So so or two or three years. But once Doyle was like, Hey, my brother's in this band, the Misfits, did suddenly that name and or the Misfits start to really like explode onto your radar, or was it always just your friend's brother's band? Yeah, nobody. I didn't know anybody who heard of them. It was just basically like, yeah, somebody would say like, oh yeah, I I heard of them. Um, you know, they play in the city or the the. What the fuck? Why did it just end like that? Well, I can explain because. When we did this interview, we used Zoom. We weren't using Melon Studio. And Zoom, because I had a free account, only allows you to do a 40-minute recording. So the first three or four parts of this are 40 minutes until finally, in the wee hours of the morning, I took out my credit card and I upgraded just for this single interview so we would not be interrupted again. So the the last part is like a three hour, I think it's like a three hour something chunk of us talking because I was getting so sick of it breaking off and then having to redo the stream. That's, see, I'm still trying to talk without saying the ums and the ands. So <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. You try it. You try and talk like this just endlessly. It's really difficult without leaving any spaces, trying not to that, what I just did right there. So in any case, more parts are coming. Did, did I, was it a tease? Did you enjoy it? Was it a, mm, ooh, ooh, give me more, give me more. Don't worry, more is coming. Talk to you soon. In the meantime, peace and hair grease. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it gonna be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. (laughs) So right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 (laughs) cents. The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. 
Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.